Chapter Seventeen of the Barnabys in America by Francis Milton Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen. Patty forms a sudden intimacy with a general's lady of saint-like propensities. A passion common to both unites them. The party at Judge Johnson's furnished a fund of conversation for the whole of Mrs. Carmichael's large domestic circle on the morrow, and had not the heart of Mrs. Beauchamp been filled by higher considerations, for she had begun to feel a very strong conviction that she was likely to become the agent of a revolution in public opinion concerning the slave states of America, little less important than that achieved by the immortal Washington. She might have found considerable gratification to her national vanity in the cordial admiration expressed concerning everything and everybody there, by the english party whom she had introduced as it was however she was intent on higher thoughts and did little more than smile and bow with contented urbanity when miss matilda perkins distinctly declared at breakfast that much as she had always enjoyed the first-rate society of london curzon street and all you know my dear mrs allen barnaby she had never seen a more perfectly elegant company than those assembled at judge johnson's and as for the gentleman she added blushing slightly and fixing her eyes upon the smoking roll she was engaged in buttering i must say that there is a thorough fashionableness and gentility about them that i don't think at all common to be met with in the old world not even the decisive and emphatic very gentlemanlike men indeed of major allen barnaby could do more than produce a repetition of the smile and the bow from mrs beauchamp although the colonel her husband was moved thereby to open his eyes more fully than he had yet done that morning and to reply i am glad to find sir that you are so thoroughly brought to that conviction at once because it will prevent any acting of prejudice upon your mind as you go on progressing in your acquaintance with the country i expect sir it was the luckiest thing you ever did coming to this part of the union in the first instance for in no other direction almost could you have hoped to have fallen so completely with the right sort you may depend upon it major allen barnaby that the great proprietors in the slave-holding states of the union are the most perfect set of gentlemen upon god's earth but mrs carmichael's breakfast-table was large enough to admit of more conversations than one being carried on at the same time and this slow solemn and deliberate speech of the colonel's did not at all interfere with what was passing at a little distance from him for some reason or other perhaps from remembering the success of miss beauchamp's efforts the evening before to make the melancholy miss perkins look gay mr egerton who had chanced to overtake the good spinster as she was descending the stairs not only addressed her cheerfully as rather an intimate acquaintance but actually offered his arm to conduct her across the hall and in this way they entered the breakfast-room together the beauchamp family had already taken their places and miss louisa strengthened in spirit by the civility of her young countrymen actually took courage as she slipped her arm away from his to approach avec intention towards a vacant chair next below that which her friend annie occupied and was rewarded for the courageous exploit by an extended hand and a smile of very kind welcome as a matter of course mr egerton followed the steps of the lady he had escorted and there being fortunately a second chair to be had below that of miss louisa he had the satisfaction of being able to place himself in close juxtaposition to her and it soon became evident not only to her observant sister but to everybody else who happened to be looking that way that the acquaintance between them was ripening into very considerable intimacy for he talked to her a great deal and because she talked to her neighbour on the other side he began to talk to her too notwithstanding his aversion to everything so completely american but he felt or was beginning to feel that there would be something quite ridiculous in his fighting the battles of his country by being rude to a young girl however thoroughly american she might be and being once awakened to the absurdity of such a line of conduct he took great care to avoid it miss matilda meanwhile having gazed for some moments on the very new and puzzling spectacle of her sister in the act of being gaily talked to and gaily listening at length hit upon a solution which easily and rationally accounted for the unusual degree of attention she appeared to be receiving miss matilda remembered how uncommonly well she herself had looked in her pale pink silk the evening before and what unmistakable proof of this she had received in the marked attentions of no less than six american gentlemen who had asked her to dance i understand it all perfectly thought she this mr egerton is just like all other englishmen so vastly fond of whatever they think is coming into fashion i know well enough what will come next louisa will have to introduce me but i can't say i care much about it just now that mr franklin brown is worth a dozen of him any day 
and as for that odious american girl she just sees that it won't do to give herself airs to any of us we are all getting too much into fashion for that to answer yes i understand it all mrs beauchamp had with an air of decision that no boarding-school etiquettes could oppose seated herself next to mrs allen barnaby and the acquaintance between these two distinguished women was advancing so rapidly towards the familiarity of friendship that they conversed wholly and solely with each other and that only in whispers and when the table broke up they left the room together arm in arm patty and her don seated as usual side by side conversed also in whispers but the happy bride condescended from time to time to interrupt this under colloquy by talking a little to the ladies named hux and grimes concerning the last night's party to which they had not been invited and which therefore offered a theme particularly fertile and to patty at least particularly gratifying but i wish you could tell me mrs grimes said she something about that nice person mrs general gregory as they call her she was most uncommon civil to me and is coming to call upon me this very day and i should like monstrously to know something about her first that i mayn't make any horrid blunders you know in talking to her oh my returned mrs grimes a fine young lady like you needn't in no way be afraid of talking to mrs general gregory for she would be quite up to understanding everything you could say to her if you was ten times over english she is first-rate standing in all ways is she rich asked patty oh goodness yes to be sure she is was the reply they have not a chick nor child belonging to them and they say his plantation is next largest to judge johnson's in carolina but then you know in course that she is one of the ladies of the new light only she makes a difference from what the eastern new lighters say on some points on account you know of the nigger population of carolina this was by no means particularly intelligible to madame tornorino and she immediately demanded with her accustomed distinctness when asking a question do you mean that she is a methodist she is one of the evangelical saints ma'am said mrs hucks in a tone that showed she held the person she alluded to in great respect well i don't care a farthing for that replied patty so as she don't wear a sanctified frightful little bonnet and a prim mouse-coloured gown and i am sure i saw no symptom of that last night for she was beautifully dressed and almost as fine as mamma i don't know whether it is the same in the old country resumed mrs grimes but with us there is a great difference in the manner in which serious ladies fix themselves some dress just as you say about the bonnet and gown and ain't that far different from quakers while there's others like mrs general gregory who declare that they despise giving any attention at all to such contemptible distinctions and say that there's no warrant for thinking that either bonnets or gowns make any difference in holiness oh well that's all right returned patty for we should never get on if she didn't approve fashionable dress i can tell her well now begging your pardon ma'am said mrs grimes that's more of an american lady's feeling than i ever expected to hear from an english woman for in course you know that the english have no great fame in the union in the article of dress all through the world i take it the americans and the french stand highest in that article i don't know anything about that replied patty i only know that i wish i had only just one hundredth part of the fine clothes i've seen in london but i shall talk to mrs general gregory about it for i intend to be great friends with her a favourable opportunity for putting this resolution in action was afforded exactly at that hour of the day when it is considered to be most genteel to make morning visits at new orleans mrs major allen barnaby and madame tornorino were both asked for by the well-appointed black footman who attended the carriage of mrs general gregory and cleopatra who answered the inquiry having first shown the exquisitely dressed and highly respected visitor into the saloon ran up the stairs to give notice to those two favoured ladies of the honour that awaited them mrs allen barnaby was at that moment in the act of writing a very important sentence in her note-book under the dictation of mrs beauchamp but hastily threw down her pencil the moment she heard the summons and prepared to obey it oh no for heaven's sake do not go now cried mrs beauchamp fervently the passage you are writing at this moment my dearest mrs allen barnaby may produce more effect from an english pen than anything that has been written for years for pity's sake don't go 
mrs allen barnaby felt her own consequence at this moment with a thrill of delight that amply atoned to her for the loss of all the doubtful glories of curzon street but being vastly too acute not to perceive the source of this dear new-born consequence she at once decided upon hazarding the loss or at any rate the delay of the well-sounding new acquaintance in the drawing-room and assuming a look and tone of enthusiasm which might really have made her fortune on any stage she replied dream not of it my invaluable friend i am not blind to the value of every acquaintance in such a country as this but there is that within my heart at this moment which renders all ordinary intercourse insipid i felt before i left my own dear but most ill-informed country that i was predestined if i may so express myself to the task of doing justice to this magnificent continent it was an enormous sacrifice that i demanded of my high-born husband and his only his lovely his newly wedded child but the especial gift that i have received from heaven my dearest mrs beauchamp is that i rarely speak in vain i explained my views my motives my hopes and you see the result you see me arrived here from my splendid english home surrounded not by my own dear family only but by valued friends whom their many excellent qualities as well as their large fortunes and distinguished birth rendered important to us this i have done for the united states of glorious america and i leave you to judge dearest lady whether i am likely to turn from such an occupation as that in which we are now engaged for the sake of any visitor in the world it must not be supposed that cleopatra waited to listen to this long harangue on the contrary she did but deliver her message and ran off again to repeat it to the young madam as she called patty who had already received her assistance in making herself rather finer than usual in preparation for the great lady who was now arrived being thus ready and alone for her dom was as usual with his respected father-in-law and in fact waiting for the summons madame tornorino lost not a moment in obeying it and was most exceedingly well pleased to find that her mamma did not appear for she had often of late felt herself more thrown into the background than any married woman ought to be by the overpowering claims of her female parent upon the eyes and ears of those around her and she rejoiced to think that she should now have an opportunity of doing herself justice patty found her visitor seated in the middle of one of mrs carmichael's large sofas as if fearful that want of space might injure the flowing pea-green satin in which she was dressed and when madame tornorino's ungloved and rather large hand was held out to welcome her mrs general gregory received it with the tips of her pale kid fingers with a great deal of refinement and good taste but mrs general gregory had once passed eight weeks in france and since that period the whole powers of her mind had been divided between two objects the first of which was to be told by a few dearly beloved spiritual friends and advisers that she was fit to be a saint in heaven and the next to understand from all the world that she was sure to be taken for a frenchwoman on earth having reseated herself after the salutation of madame tornorino smoothed the folds of her robe and arranged the lace of her cloak mrs general gregory opened the conversation by inquiring if madame tornorino had as yet attached herself to any particular congregation in the union few young women of patty's age were better qualified to give an off-hand answer to a question not perfectly understood than herself a faculty partly perhaps inherited from her mother who had passed a great part of her life in acquiring the art of appearing to know many things of which she was profoundly ignorant but chiefly it was derived from an innate fund of original impudence which gave her courage to dash at everything confident alike in her own cleverness which she felt made a good hit probable and in her own audacity which she also felt would render defeat indifferent but in spite both of this moral and intellectual courage the question of her new acquaintance startled her in most of her previous adventures of this hit-and-miss kind with strangers she had either caught a glimpse of their meaning or fancied she had done so but now she had not the very slightest idea of what was meant and was in the greatest danger of being forced to say so when her good genius came to her aid and shaking back her heavy black ringlets in the most unembarrassed manner possible she said why really ma'am we have had no time yet for anything i am delighted to hear it my dear madam replied the elegant visitor for in such a business as that to which i allude nothing is so much to be avoided as rashness and over haste to say the honest truth indeed i was a little in the hope that i might find it so and nothing can more exactly convene to my wishes than that by thus early cultivating your acquaintance i may be the means of leading you in the right way what was poor patty to say now 
clever creature she only shook her ringlets again and said i am sure you are very kind i mean to be so my dear young friend replied the excellent mrs general gregory looking with great kindness upon the french embroidery of patty's collar and cuffs which was as quickly discerned to be such by her studious and learned eye as the text of elzevir by the sharp can of a scholar i mean to be so i am aware what the object of your admirable mother is in coming to this country and i conceive it to be my bounden duty knowing as by grace and mercy i do that i have made my own calling and election sure i expect my dear young lady that it is neither more nor less i say than my commanded duty to do what i can towards helping others and where oh my where shall i find anybody so every manner worthy of being helped on towards the same election as a family to whom the whole union is likely to be so deeply indebted as they are to be to yours patty began to see the light she had already heard an immense deal of talk considering how short a time she had been in the country upon elections of all imaginable sorts and kinds in a free country like america everything is done by election from choosing a president to the appointing a pew-opener and having listened with her usual sharpness to all this she now became convinced that mrs general gregory was going to propose her papa or perhaps her own dear don for the stewardship of a ball or a horse-race exceedingly delighted by this idea patty eagerly exclaimed dear me how very kind and obliging i don't think there is anything that we should all of us from first to last like so well all alas my dear young lady all is too extensive a word replied mrs general gregory when you have reached my age she added with a gentle smile and still gentler sigh you will leave off including the gents so freely in such work as we are talking about if you knew as well as i do the often hardness of heart and the frequent blindness of eyes in the unfeminine part of the best society you would quite altogether i expect leave off saying a word about all the mystification of poor patty now returned upon her with threefold darkness and feeling that she was sinking deeper and deeper and might very likely get into a scrape at last her indigenous wit sprung up in another direction and caused her to exclaim with an air of good-humoured naivete i declare my dear ma'am i don't believe that i understand what you mean mrs general gregory replied first by looking earnestly and pitifully in her face for a few moments and then by saying is it possible my dear young lady that by the ever merciful but inscrutable interference of providence it falls to my happy lot to be the first that ever availed your dear precious young spirit of the necessity of calling together into families the chosen of the lord's people here on earth why really yes ma'am replied patty slightly yawning i can't say that in england i ever heard anything said about dividing ladies and gentlemen into families are they indeed so benighted my dear young friend demanded mrs general gregory clasping her hands fervently together and heaving a deep sigh then indeed it will be a privilege and very precious glory to have the task of awakening the soul of a young lady whose appearance is so every way interesting and approvable and here again the general's lady perhaps involuntarily looked at the pretty new dress which madame tornorino had obtained at howell and james's upon her papa's curzon street credit a day or two before she left london it will indeed be very precious to me madame tornorino my dear to save so sweet a young brand from the burning now here was sympathy if ever it existed upon earth mrs general gregory looked at patty's silk and embroidery and preached to her about election because she approved them while patty gazed upon mrs general gregory's satin and lace and patiently listened because she too approved from this point the conversation proceeded very amicably the american lady judiciously mixing enough of worldly talk to make her friendly overtures palatable to the as yet unregenerated neophyte and the english one enduring the monstrous bore of her new friend's talk for the sake of having a fine acquaintance that seemed to think her of almost as much consequence as her mamma chapter seventeen Chapters eighteen and nineteen of the Barnabys in America by Francis Milton Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eighteen. 
a slight sketch of the general's lady who makes sundry friendly but puzzling offers to patty the pious lady delivers her opinions upon the origin of slavery it will not be irrelevant to this minute narrative of the barnaby progress through the united states to give a slight sketch of this new friend of madame tornorino as it will help to explain the cause for which so sedate and elegant a personage as mrs general gregory deemed it desirable to cultivate an intimacy with the young and blooming impudence of our patty she had in truth very strong reasons for it as no race is so sharp as that which goes neck and neck from the starting to the winning post so no rivalry is so keen as that which in like manner exists between two persons nearly equal at all points between the ladies of the two great carolinian planters general gregory and colonel beauchamp there was at their country residence near neighbourhood and considerable intimacy and there was also both in country and in town a pretty constant but even civil struggle for superiority in consideration and as the transatlantics expressively term it in standing when having both of them passed the age of forty the two wealthy possessors of two of the finest plantations and two of the finest gangs of slaves in south carolina united themselves in holy wedlock with two of the most celebrated beauties of baltimore the young ladies were installed in their respective mansions with a degree of first-rateness that was very dangerously equal for it instantly gave birth to a rivalship which had lasted ever since the first atom of ground gained by either of these ladies in advance of the other was on the part of mrs general gregory who unexpectedly announced un beau matin to her friend and neighbour that she had just completed an arrangement with one of the general's french correspondents a wholesale coffee dealer for his despatching to her twice every year a box of millinery direct from paris for a few months this blow was felt severely it was vain that mrs colonel beauchamp appeared in the most elegant habillement that charlestown new orleans baltimore or even new york itself could furnish for it constantly happened upon her appearing before her neighbour with any article of dress which that lady had not before seen her wear that an observation followed accompanied with a multitude of obliging apologies to the effect that she had that very morning received a letter direct from her paris milliner to tell her that that particular article was completely out of fashion and to warn her against any attempts on the part of the milliners of the united states to pass such things off upon her as new it is necessary to know the sensitive delicacy of feeling on such points which prevails among ladies of high standing in america in order to conceive the severity of the trial to which the temper of mrs beauchamp was exposed by this mode of proceeding the first idea which occurred to her as suggesting the possibility of relief under it was the opening a correspondence herself with a parisian milliner but unfortunately colonel beauchamp's coffee was all consigned to liverpool and he had no french correspondent whatever no not even so much as at havre who might assist in favouring such a design it was therefore after many vain attempts finally abandoned and the genius of mrs beauchamp was called upon to devise some counter-current of superiority which might enable her to shun the buffetings and the bruises which the high tide of her friend's good fortune had brought upon her nor did the lady long meditate upon the subject in vain she really was a clever woman though on some particular subjects a little more vehement than reasonable and upon everything relating to her unequalled country as she always called it and everything connected with its constitution laws customs and peculiarities from an abhorrence of monarchy to an adoration of slavery inclusive she not only was vehement both in feeling and expression but would have considered it a very grievous sin to be otherwise people who like mrs beauchamp think and speak with more violence than profundity are apt to attach value to their own powers of advocating whatever cause they espouse and while the lady of the big gang-bank was meditating at what point her powers of intellect or of fortune might best enable her to outshine the lady of rice lawn paradise a certain thought darted into her head which had she been desired to explain it she would probably have called a patriotic inspiration she suddenly remembered how her father of honoured and blessed memory had ceased not morning noon or night as long as life had been lent him to hold forth on the atrocious dishonesty and injustice those specific accusations being the favourite stronghold of his clique of all who dared to impugn the holiness and the lawfulness of slavery she remembered too the love the reverence the gratitude and the admiration with which he had ever been listened to by everybody or at least by everybody whose love reverence gratitude and admiration she thought worth having 
and from that moment of happy reminiscence which occurred exactly three years after her marriage down to the present hour mrs colonel beauchamp had acquired the reputation of being the most thorough-going out-and-out patriot and right-down first-rate smart woman in the union the result of this very brilliant success was speedily seen and painfully felt by mrs general gregory but she too as it seemed had some kind guardian spirit that watched over her destiny some of the light militia of the lower sky who in all lands watch over the changeful little destinies of the ladies led her from rice lawn paradise to the city of baltimore precisely at the moment when it was glowing like furnace from end to end with the burning eloquence of a multitude of itinerant preachers assembled there from all parts of the country for the purpose of celebrating that very singular transatlantic solemnity called a revival the same guardian sylph who had guided her in this propitious hour to baltimore guided her likewise into a fashionable chapel where a fashionable preacher was assuring a multitude of fashionable ladies that without the grace and comfort which he and a few of his particular friends and brethren alone could give they must all fall headlong into the bottomless pit while listening to this much admired gentleman mrs general gregory was greatly struck by the beautiful display of feeling with which many first-rate ladies came forward at his call and placed themselves on the anxious benches set apart for all those who wished to distinguish themselves by such a fearless demonstration of piety as this act demanded in truth mrs general gregory was like many other persons very much struck by this edifying spectacle she too wished to be distinguished having as we know very particular reasons for it and here most providentially displayed to her was the mode by which this earnest wish might be at once obtained during the few moments of hesitation which followed the conception of this happy idea she overheard the following remarks from some of the most elegantly dressed ladies in the chapel who fortunately happened to be placed immediately before her my exclaimed one of them if there isn't mrs governor robson going right away for the anxious bench that will make a pretty considerable noise won't it noise i expect so my dear was the reply and won't she added the second speaker be more the thing than ever with all the high flyers my what a sight of party she'll be giving this revival i'll engage for it and what an unhandsome fix we should have got into shouldn't we if we had taken it into our heads to stay away we should have got no invites you may be availed of that i expect all this was uttered with very little restraint as to the tone of voice for the noise produced near the anxious benches by the exhortations or the comfortings of the preachers prevented anything uttered in any part of the chapel from being heard except those very near the speaker every word however was distinctly heard by mrs general gregory and every word produced effect before the same hour on the following day she had been presented to the most celebrated of the reverend gentlemen who were at that time performing at baltimore and having with all due ceremony declared herself desirous of becoming one of his congregation she was installed as a sister accordingly appeared on the anxious bench a few days afterwards and being a lady of large fortune and particularly desirous of becoming if not the first in the very first line soon became spoken of in all directions as one of the most shining lights which had been for a long time added to the temple of the new jerusalem for some time the excellent and exemplary mrs general gregory had every possible reason to be satisfied with the effects of the course she had pursued she became in her turn the centre of a circle and felt herself fully as able to sustain a competition with mrs colonel beauchamp as she had ever been but at length she had the sagacity to discover that highly distinguished as she was mrs beauchamp's essays on the righteousness of slavery were listened to with more gusto by their mutual acquaintance than her own little sermonettes on the righteousness of the elect nor did the cause of this long remain a mystery to her she saw plainly in short that the magnates of south carolina were more inclined to sympathize with her rival's enthusiasm than with her own and from this time forward it would have been impossible for any one acquainted with all the circumstances of the case not to have admired the skill with which she made head against the difficulties she encountered her conversation became a sort of curious mosaic made up as it were with bits of black and white and showed such a skilful mixture of christian texts with slave-holding principles as could certainly be met with in no country of the world save that of which she had the honour and happiness of being a citizen but it answered perfectly 
and if mrs colonel beauchamp was known among the best society of the union as a right-down first-rate patriot lady mrs general gregory was equally renowned as tuppermost among the right-thinking of the saintly party who knew the duty they owed to the stars and stripes too well not to make up their religious principles square with the same it may in some cases be true that the native literati of america have no great reason to boast of the honours and profits accorded upon them in their own country at least before they have received the timbre bestowed upon them by the approbation of ours but if they find readier and warmer welcome in other lands the literati of other lands en revanche find in the united states a warmer welcome perhaps than anywhere else it being quite sufficient for an individual to carry the name of author there in order to ensure him a buzz of celebrity from one end of the country to the other no wonder therefore was it that mrs general gregory being in the position above described should be desirous of sharing in the great barnaby intimacy enjoyed by mrs colonel beauchamp and when she discovered as she did at the party of mrs judge johnson that besides the authorship there was still nearer and dearer claim to friendship which mrs barnaby's loudly proclaimed opinion on the great african subject gave her there was nothing which she did not feel ready to do and to say in order to obtain a forward and conspicuous place in the good opinion of the family no sooner however had madame tornorino become fully aware of the strongly pious propensities of her visitor than her ardour to cultivate the acquaintance relaxed and it is probable that she would not long have delayed betraying some symptoms of this had not mrs general gregory either from anticipating this very natural result or from yielding to her own native propensities suddenly changed her hand and led the discourse to gayer themes but oh my she exclaimed with a pleasant little laugh i must not keep on talking for everlasting this way about chapel going and all that sort of thing to a pretty young lady like you madame tornorino who in course must have your mind filled up as yet with plenty of other things in part you know i mean my dear and that is all so very natural that i can't say i realize as being anywise improper you will be pleased to remember my dear that my carriage and servants and myself too will be quite at your service madame tornorino whenever you like to declare your congregation and i'll take you to the best seat in the chapel for seeing the company and the dresses as well as for hearing that blessed vessel mr crawley pour forth his balm but if you like it better in the first place i'll be delighted to take you with me and your honourable mamma too if she'll be pleased to go to a first-rate dancing party to-morrow night that the lady of our prime newspaper writer of all this south part of the union is going to give thank you ma'am replied patty cheerily i should like it best of anything that is if you are going to be so kind as to ask my husband don tornorino too most certainly my dear i am and will you go with me to chapel next sabbath patty paused for half a moment before she replied and her answer showed that she was improving rapidly in wisdom of all sorts oh dear yes certainly ma'am i suppose that is just the same as going to church in england which is the best thing i am sure that one can do of a sunday because you know it was lucky perhaps that mrs gregory's general habit of making herself spokeswoman upon all religious subjects caused her to break in at this point upon patty's speech as it is possible that she might have completed it by adding there is no other place full of people to go to but when her new acquaintance did it for her by saying i do indeed my dear i do know that no place except the heaven of heavens its blessed self can be so good for christians to enter as the chapels and churches of the saints patty was discreet enough to answer oh yes to be sure ma'am every one knows that of course adding however for the sake of a little useful information but you don't seem to be too stiff to go to dances and parties ma'am goodness forbid i should my dear replied the general's lady i hold it to be exceedingly sinful to turn my back upon the weak and the sinning just because i have made my own election sure i am sorry and grieved to say that there are in the union some professing christians and not a few i am afraid who act very differently if you visit the eastern cities you will find many such but they are clearly benighted in their generation and go about it it is dreadful to think of it doing mischief instead of good for it is the very same people as turn their faces away from their white fellow-creatures as if they were not good enough for them that go communing with the very people that wear god's mark upon their skins 
the black descendants of the wicked cain you know my dear young lady the horrid impure nigger slaves that wear by nature the mark that ought to warn the people of god to turn away from them and make them to labour from the rising up of the sun even to the going down of the same as the hand of the lord points out but we of the south madam tornorino i am happy and blessed to say no better you will never hear of such abominations among the educated and elegant gentry of the slave-holding states we are quite altogether a different people and population as i hope your dear mamma will make manifest and as to not going to balls and parties my dear i should blush to show any such weakness this last sentence as every last sentence ought to do left so pleasant an impression upon the mind of the person to whom it was addressed that she remembered nothing which preceded it with displeasure and when mrs general gregory took her leave madame tornorino was quite ready to declare that though a bit of quiz in her talk now and then she was upon the whole a most delightful woman and that she should take good care to be very intimate with her chapter nineteen mrs allen barnaby commences her work on the united states of america mrs beauchamp requests a specimen of it a fine national trait while the visit of mrs general gregory lasted mrs colonel beauchamp continued in some sort to keep watch over mrs allen barnaby for the idea of her leaving her note-book for the purpose of receiving the civilities of the general's lady was very particularly disagreeable to the lady of the colonel and she was determined not to quit her till the danger was past nor was the keeping her pen in hand the only use which she made of this interval she had pledged herself to several of the most important personages in the southern part of the union that such a book should be written by her english friend on the country in general and on the slave-holding states in particular as had never yet appeared from the pen of any european traveller and which would be calculated to do unspeakable good in every part of the world as tending to put in a right point of view that which hitherto had been so repeatedly placed in a wrong one having proclaimed this and received in consequence of it the most cordial thanks and the warmest eulogiums on her patriotic zeal it was become a matter of great personal importance to mrs beauchamp that mrs allen barnaby should lose no time in giving proof unquestionable and evidence as clear as light that she mrs beauchamp had in no way misrepresented or exaggerated either the purpose or the power of this distinguished traveller with this object she determined if possible to induce her immediately to produce a specimen sufficient to prove first that she really was employed in writing on the subject and secondly that her manner of treating it was what she had declared it should be hitherto all that mrs allen barnaby appeared to have done was the scribbling a few words first on one page and then on another of her new notebook this had been performed in the presence of mrs beauchamp and though that well-educated lady felt that this was very likely to be the way in which books were really made she felt that she should be better satisfied if she could see a sheet or two of full-sized paper written all over and with a title at the beginning this feeling however arose much less from any doubts she entertained respecting either the intentions or the capacity of mrs allen barnaby than from an almost feverish impatience that the business should begin mrs beauchamp had a pretty considerable good opinion of her own ability and she had no doubt whatever that if mrs allen barnaby would once set to work there could be as long as she continued near her no doubt whatever of her producing precisely the sort of thing that was wished for hardly therefore had cleopatra's step ceased to clatter on the stairs when the lady of the colonel thus addressed the lady of the major how thoroughly elegant and clever this is of you my dear mrs allen barnaby thus to give up everything as i may say for your great work but i promise you my dear madam that your light shall not be hid under a bushel but shall blaze away before the judge and before everybody else of the greatest real high standing in new orleans they will one and all be ready to worship the ground you tread upon when i tell them as i most certainly shall do that you give up everything for the sake of progressing with your travels you don't know my dear mrs allen barnaby the prodigious fuss that the people will make about you as you go on if it is actually known for certain that you are positively employed upon such a work as we have been talking about known for certain my dear friend returned mrs allen barnaby with something like indignation in her tone do you mean to say that anybody doubts it 
i don't mean i expect to say anything that could hurt your feelings dear lady returned mrs beauchamp but when you know our splendid national character better you will understand the sort of fineness of intellect which always makes them doubt everything that they don't see with their eyes and i must say that this taken together with some other of their ways of going on does make out upon the whole the most finished model of a perfect gentleman in the world because you see my dear lady that this doubtingness does not argue any want of trustfulness which might seem suspicious and no way noble but that's what nobody can say for where is the nation to be found who gives and takes credit like the americans oh no it is not for want of trust for everything is done upon trust here and if it was not it would never be done at all but it is just about things where nothing is to be got by giving or taking credit that they are so particular for then their fine national sense tells them plain enough that the best way to believe is to see that is indeed a very fine trait to which you have just alluded said mrs allen barnaby seizing her note-book which for a moment she had laid aside that national habit of feeling confidence and acting so completely as you say upon credit ought to be dwelt upon and must i should think my dear madam have a very considerable effect upon my english readers for in our country as i have always understood it is necessary to show a good deal of ready money before you can ever get credit at all it really is a very fine national trait and mrs allen barnaby wrote several lines in her note-book it is a fine national trait replied mrs beauchamp with great energy and it is american all over but to come back my dear lady to what i was saying about our clear-headed citizens liking to see before they believe it is quite beautiful i expect to observe how the two things unite and make one as i may say in the minds of our patriots and you my dear mrs allen barnaby who are smart enough so clearly to comprehend these first-rate qualities you would i expect be the very last to refuse compliance with the wishes of all the people of first standing in new orleans at this moment present you would not like to do that mrs allen barnaby i guess say not for the universe my dearest friend exclaimed the authoress tell me but what these patriotic gentlemen wish me to do and i will do it instantly there is not a single one of them my dear madam but what shall be availed of your great obligingness returned her friend all that i wish you to do my excellent lady is just that you should write out a bit of a sort of introductory chapter saying what you are going to do and what you think of all you have seen as yet and your principles and opinions about the slaves and then write at the top of it the title in good large letters that should look something like the beginning of a real book and that i guess will be all they wish for just at present and for this i won't deny but what they are longing one and all of them they took care to avail me of that i promise you before i took leave of mrs judge johnson last night there was something rather abruptly startling to mrs allen barnaby in this unexpected demand but being a woman of nerve instead of a nervous woman she sustained the attack with great resolution and after about a moment's reflection replied smilingly you are aware my dear friend that the book in question is to be the history of my travels through your noble country do you think that as yet i have seen enough of it to venture upon writing anything oh dear me yes my good lady without any question of doubt you have replied mrs beauchamp all that we ask for as yet you know is just what sort of feeling the first sight of the country produced and your views founded upon your own good sense about the niggers promising you know to study the question deeply as you progress and then the title and that's just about all that we want for the present so that a mere page or two of writing you see will do then a page or two of writing shall be produced immediately replied mrs allen barnaby with decision but of course you are aware dear madam that we authors always find it necessary to be alone when we write our books it is always a terrible pain to part with you my dear mrs beauchamp but if i am to set about writing at once i must have a minute or two to myself if you please just to think about it 
mrs beauchamp herself seemed to consider that this was no more than reasonable and hearing mrs general gregory's carriage drive away at that moment she got up at once and left the room saying as she went towards the door oh my how i do envy you mrs allen barnaby such a subject to be sure as you have got before you and such kind and partial readers as you are like to find among us envy me indeed muttered the overhurried authoress as the door was closed upon her what idiot fools they must all be to fancy that i have seen any wonders to write about in rather less than a week the most wonderful thing i know about them is what i got from donny as to their every one of them being cheats and that is curious enough to be sure and might amuse the folks at home to know if one did but dare to tell it but this is all folly and nonsense and as like as can be to quarrelling with one's bread and butter if they were not the vain peacocks they are how would my sitting down to write a book about them be so like as it is to make my fortune before it is half done and soothed by this agreeable reflection mrs allen barnaby really did set about her task in good earnest settling her chair placing a whole quire of paper before her and fixing a steel pen to her fancy half done she repeated with a little quiet solitary laugh half a sheet will be enough to turn all their heads and to bring them crawling on all fours to my feet if i do but put in palaver enough and now the important business was actually begun and mrs allen barnaby in turning over the first page of her book turned over a new page in her own history also and she felt this felt that her genius had now brought her to another epoch of her fate and she doubted not but that she should date from it the growth and the ripening of honour profit and renown what matters it said she renewing her soliloquy what matters it how or in what manner a book or anything else is managed so that one gets just exactly the thing one wants by it it would be just as easy for me to write all truth as all lies about this queer place and all these monstrous odd people but wouldn't i be a fool if i did any such thing and is it one bit more trouble to write all these monstrous fine words just like what i have read over and over again in novels is it one bit more trouble i should like to know writing them all in one sense instead of the other mrs allen barnaby suspended her soliloquy at this point and began leisurely and critically to read what she had written she smiled as perhaps only authors smile as she perused the sentences which she had composed i always have succeeded in everything that i attempted to do she said with a feeling of triumphant confidence which made her grasp her pen firmly and replenish it with ink as confidently as ever soldier drew his sword or cocked his pistol and again she wrote page after page became covered with the somewhat broad and square but tolerably firm characters of her pen till once again she stopped took breath and reasoned a little well to be sure thought she these american people do seem to be out of luck by their own account in all the books that have been written about them poor souls by what they say i suppose they have been pretty roughly drawn over the coals by one and all of the author gentry that have set to work upon them and then here come i quite as well able to write a book as any of them i fancy and ready enough for my own particular reasons to praise them all up to the very skies and yet somehow or other i don't suppose that any living soul but themselves will believe there is a word of truth in it from beginning to end and that i do call being monstrous unlucky but what the deuce do i care for that i have got an object i suppose and my business is to obtain it without bothering my brains about who will or will not believe all the things that i choose to write down and now again mrs allen barnaby resumed her pen and the colourless paper became rapidly tinted by her ink it is a good thing however she resumed that it goes off so glib and easy as it seems to do if i was always quite sure about the spelling of the words i declare i think i should find it quite as easy as talking i do wonder sometimes where i got all my cleverness from there isn't many though i say it that shouldn't but that's only when nobody hears me there isn't many that could go on as i have done from the very first almost that i remember anything always getting on and on and on there's a pretty tolerable difference thank heaven between what i am now with judges and members and i don't know who all smirking and speechifying to me and what i was when my name was martha compton without two decent gowns perhaps to my back and not knowing where on earth to get another when they were gone however 
added the retrospective lady smiling as some comical recollection seemed to cross her mind i contrived to manage pretty well even then and i shall contrive to manage pretty well now too or i'm greatly mistaken there that's enough for one bout and so saying the well-pleased mrs allen barnaby laid the sheets she had filled neatly together and went to look at herself for a minute or two in the glass well she murmured again in soothing soliloquy if i don't look quite as young as i did when i was martha compton i have gained in dignity quite as much as i've lost in beauty i do look like a duchess i'll be hanged if i don't and i do believe in my conscience that when i can get the things to put on i dress as well as any woman that ever lived i see nobody anywhere that looks as really stylish as i do and just the sort of thing i should think for a fashionable authoress no shyness no stupid awkward fear of anybody or anything i certainly have thank god a great many advantages and i may thank myself that i know how to make use of them in short few authors ever rose from their first hour of literary labour better satisfied with themselves and their production than mrs allen barnaby but she had still another hour of leisure before it was necessary for her to begin dressing for dinner and for an evening party that was to follow after mrs carmichael having obligingly desired her boarders to invite any friends they liked as she was going to have a soiree herself on looking at her watch and perceiving that this unoccupied interval remained mrs allen barnaby's first thought was to employ it by going to seek patty and the perkinses in order to indulge herself by vapouring a little about her new occupation but a second thought brought with it a doubt as to how far any one of the three might be capable of appreciating the species of dignity which she was beginning very strongly to feel belonged to her in her new character and she therefore changed her purpose into the much more profitable one of sitting down again to her writing-table i know a thing will put em all in a rapture of delight thought mrs allen barnaby as she again took up her pen i will just write down a list of questions for mrs beauchamp or her famous judge johnson to answer and they will do double work or am greatly mistaken for i will put them all upon thinking and saying that i am so clever and so anxious for information and at the same time it will give them exactly what they seem to love best in the world and that is an opportunity of talking about themselves and their country and their glorious constitution she then took a fresh sheet of paper and after a little reflection produced the following list of interrogatories in what manner does the republican form of government appear to affect the social habits of the people how far does the absence of a national form of worship produce the results anticipated from it at what degree of elevation may the education of the ladies of the union be considered to stand when compared to that received by the females of other countries in what manner was slavery originally instituted and what are its real effects both on the black and the white population mrs allen barnaby almost laughed aloud with delight when she had written the above and in truth she had very sufficient reason to be contented with herself a very few days had passed since the hour in which she had heard for the first time in her life any one of the above subjects alluded to and had not the admirable quickness of her charming intellect enabled her to catch the very words which she had heard used by the distinguished patriots among whom she had so happily fallen the writing the above pithy sentences would have been as completely out of her power as the indicting so much greek but never did any woman know better how to profit by opportunity than mrs allen barnaby and great as was the elevation to which she now appeared likely to reach it is impossible to deny that she deserved it she then began in excellent spirits the somewhat laborious but always delightful labours of the toilette with heart as gay and eye very nearly as bright as when she had dressed to meet lord mucklebury at her first cheltenham ball in truth everything seemed to favour her projects and assure her the most unqualified success the party about to assemble that evening in mrs carmichael's ample saloon was likely to be very miscellaneous inasmuch as every boarder had the privilege of giving invitations as freely as mrs carmichael herself an arrangement which could not fail of bringing together exactly such a mixture of all sorts of men as it would be most desirable for her to gain golden opinions from and golden or at any rate silver opinions she was determined to make them mrs allen barnaby was still in the act of adoring with head uncovered the cosmetic powers when the major entered he was immediately struck by the general brightness and animation of her aspect and exclaimed hey day my barnaby what has happened now 
if there were any lady susans here i should say that some of them had been making some charming proposal for taking you to court again upon my soul my dear you look as if you had been eating live birds and that their bright little eyes were looking out through your own who have you seen what have you been doing and though the major as he spoke began steadily enough the business of refreshing his dress he continued to keep his eyes fixed upon his ample spouse with a good deal of curiosity and it may be with a little admiration who have i seen and what have i been doing repeated his lady with a very benignant smile as to seeing mr major i have seen little or nothing except indeed that everlasting mrs beauchamp but as to doing it is not my place to talk about that donny dear i will just leave you to form your own judgment on the subject upon my word we have neither of us any time to talk about it now for i am not half done yet and as for you your beard is as long as aaron's major though i know you mowed it only yesterday but that comes of the climate you know so set to there's a good man and in the course of the evening i will see if i cannot indulge you my dear with a little insight into what i have done am doing and may be about to do well i must consent i suppose to live in the dark my dear till it shall be your will and pleasure to grant me light returned her amiable husband and while the dressing lasted nothing further passed between them on the subject of mrs allen barnaby's occupations except a few mystic and perfectly unintelligible words uttered from time to time by the lady herself End of chapters eighteen and nineteen chapter twenty of the barnabys in america by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty mrs carmichael entertains a splendid evening party of which mrs allen barnaby is the heroine the nature and principles of her book are fully explained to the company and received with enthusiastic applause mrs allen barnaby propounds various questions to the company which are most satisfactorily answered the evening party at mrs carmichael's was a very large one much larger as that panting and blowing lady assured the company than she had at all expected adding however that if they could all make themselves comfortable she should be right down glad they were all come though for sure and certain she did not expect the one half so many neither the invited nor the inviters however appeared at all offended by these hints and tea coffee lemonade and whisky drinking went on very prosperously at length mrs beauchamp who in answer to a question gently asked had learnt from her friend mrs allen barnaby that she had no objection whatever to her mentioning the fact of her having actually begun her work addressing herself particularly to that portion of the company which crowded round herself and her splendid english friend said i have the greatest pleasure in informing the honourable judge johnson his lady general gregory mrs general gregory and in short all the friends that are interested in the news that our talented english lady friend mrs major allen barnaby has done commenced her elegant and handsome work upon the land of the stars and the stripes and i am not that much doubtful of her kindness but what i think there is pretty considerable good hope that if the honourable judge johnson would make the request to the lady she would favour the company by reading up a little of it for their advantage and that mrs major allen barnaby would be clever enough to sit down straight away at once and give us the pleasure and improvement we wish for by making us acquainted with what she has done this harangue was received by a murmur of applause that evidently proceeded not only from that portion of the company particularly addressed but from every quarter of the room and when the buzz this produced had a little subsided the honourable judge johnson replied we cannot by many degrees thank you enough my excellent mrs colonel beauchamp for the service which your truly patriotic conduct has conferred upon us all but in the name not only of the present company but of every part of the union except indeed that unhappy portion of it which refuses to rejoice in the greatest blessing left to us by the mighty washington and sanctified as i may say by the holy memory of the immortal jefferson i mean of course the misguided states who refuse to possess the blessing of a slave in the name of the present company and of all the soundly patriotic portion of the union i beg to thank your admirable friend for the very noble effort she is making in the cause of truth and impartiality and i beg to say that one and all of us neither can nor do desire anything better than just to sit ourselves down round about the lady so that we may not lose a single one of the precious words which she is going to have the elegant cleverness to read to us 
the consequence of this speech from the richest man in the room was an immediate drawing together of the company round mrs allen barnaby while several of the gentlemen began actively to move forward a table a chair and a footstool for the authoress and when she had placed herself which she did with great stateliness and dignity every one present got as near to her as was conveniently possible every sofa and every chair being put in requisition and made to approach the end of the room whence the attraction emanated the honourable judge johnson himself sat at her right hand and her deeply interested friend mrs beauchamp at her left miss matilda perkins who had found out a new way of making herself interesting and agreeable to the many tall beautiful-looking american gentlemen who still continued to take so much delightful notice of her ceased not in the very centrical place which she had chosen to indulge in the most expressive dumb show demonstrations of love and admiration for the authoress assuring several in whispers breathed into their eagerly presented ears that her dearest of all dear friends mrs allen barnaby was certainly sent by providence to speak of that unequalled country called the united states of america in the manner it deserved for that there never was no never such a woman for talents and learning of all sorts her crowning phrase being at the end of every whisper oh madame de stalley was nothing to her the quiet miss louisa only too happy in being permitted to have a place by her friend annie sat at an open window at some distance from the more crowded part of the room while mr egerton who now paid her quite attention enough to have convinced her sister had she been its object that he was only waiting for a favourable opportunity of declaring himself her lover stationed himself at a convenient point for speaking either to her or her thoroughly american companion if he wished it without the necessity to do it so loudly as to attract the attention of the others the major who was exceedingly amused and also exceedingly well pleased by the apparent success of this new exhibition of his wife's cleverness had placed himself very much at his ease on one of the sofas that was too large and heavy to be moved but from whence he had a full view of her and of all her goings-on and being well aware of the audibility of her voice he had no fear but that he should hear every word she spoke patty who was still too much in love to think it much worth while to listen to anything but her husband having entered the room when it was full employed some time in a very active search for him and at length discovered that her beloved don was fast asleep under an orange tree on the balcony but as none of her pinches and twitches sufficed to awaken him she at length determined to leave him at peace and placed herself next to her beautifully dressed friend mrs general gregory finding a great relief in an accurate examination of all she wore whenever it happened that her mamma's eloquence was particularly overpowering the movement and the bustle and the whisper and the buzz which of necessity precedes the calm required for such a business as that now going on being at length over the honourable judge johnson said aloud and very distinctly now then my dear lady we all trust and hope that you are ready to begin mrs allen barnaby bowed with grace and dignity to the gentleman who thus addressed her shook a lavender water odour from her pocket-handkerchief pushed back with the tips of her left-hand fingers the abounding curls from her forehead and with those of her right lightly passed over the page that lay on the table before her to restore its level smoothness and then began justice done at last or the travels of mrs major allen barnaby through the united states of america having pronounced this title in a voice clear distinct and very sufficiently loud the lady paused for a moment to let the applause she expected and which failed not to come pass away mr egerton whose eyes had been fixed on the authoress as she read it turned perhaps involuntarily to the face of annie afterwards it might be that he expected to see her look exceedingly delighted at the prospect thus held out of praise and honour to be conferred on her beloved country but if so he was disappointed for the fair face of the young lady was tinted with a blush that looked much more like the glow of anger or of shame than of pleasure and as her eye met his she turned from him with a frown of displeasure which she could not help thinking was exceedingly undeserved he never having taken any such liberty as that which now seemed to displease her in his life he consoled himself however by remembering how excessively absurd it would be should he try to persuade himself that he cared a straw whether an american miss smiled or frowned upon him so he did but smile in return for her frown and again fixed his eyes on mrs allen barnaby the applause created by her title being over and expectant silence restored that lady again took her manuscript from the table where she had replaced it while slightly agitating her handkerchief and gracefully acknowledging the plaudits of the company by her smiles and bows and thus resumed 
in giving to the world the following narrative of my travels through that most glorious country known by the name of the united states of america my principal object is to wipe away from the minds of my readers every trace of all that they had ever read or heard upon that subject before for till this has been done it is vain to hope that the multitude of important facts with which i have been fortunate enough to become acquainted can be received as they ought to be nobody properly qualified to write upon this wonderful country could behold a single town a single street a single house a single individual of it for just one single half-hour without feeling all over to his very heart convinced that not all the countries of the old world put together are worthy to compare in any one respect from the very greatest to the very least with the free-born the free-bred the immortal and ten hundred thousand times more glorious country generally called that of the stars and the stripes the country of the stars and the stripes is in fact and beyond all reach of contradiction the finest country in the whole world and the simple truth is that nobody who really knows anything about it can ever think of calling it anything else it is just the biggest and the best and that is saying everything in two words admirable exclaimed mrs beauchamp raising her fine eyes towards heaven and then pressing her pocket-handkerchief to them in a manner that plainly showed the profound sensibility with which she listened to praise so justly due and so warmly uttered upon the merits of her beloved country oh it is admirable admirable it is first-rate ma'am said the honourable judge johnson warmly i expect madam he added turning towards mrs allen barnaby i expect that nobody has yet come among us so elegantly well qualified as yourself for doing the justice that you promise us i do not mean to speak alone of your particular great talents and beautiful accomplishments in writing but i guess that it is because you have moved in the very highest of circles yourself that you are more up to the comprehending and admiring everything you have found here than any of the low whippersnapper people as have come before you that is what i guess to be the reason and true cause of the difference you do me but justice my dear sir replied mrs allen barnaby with an air that might justly be called majestically modest you do me but justice in supposing that i am rather out of the common way capable of appreciating what is noble and superior heaven knows that i have no very great liking or partiality to the ways and manners of my own country but yet in justice to myself i think it but right to mention that my very last visit in london was to the drawing-room of the queen i must beg and entreat that i may not be misunderstood in saying this and that none of this charming company will suppose for an instant that i think over much about queens and kings and those sort of people nobody i am sure can be farther from it than i am but nevertheless i just mention this to prove that the honourable judge johnson is right and quite correct in what he has been pleased to say about my being capable of judging and i do believe most truly that the reason why so much as i am told has been said about the backwardness and elegance of this most great and glorious country is that all the people who have come over here before are of an inferior class and not used so much to the very first circles as i confess i have been then the murder's out and that's the truth of it exclaimed colonel wingrove a member of congress and a man of fashion who was one of mrs carmichael's boarders all i wanted was to hear some of the english confess it themselves for it is exactly what i have said a thousand and a thousand times and it is astonishing to me that common sense has not pointed that out to everybody long and long ago for doesn't it stand to reason that we know what we are our own selves who is there i should have liked to be told so capable of judging what our manners are as the first-rate educated among ourselves and yet people among us as ought to know better are for ever fretting and fuming because half a dozen vulgar low-borns who never knew the elegant luxury of owning a score of slaves to wait upon em have come and gone without having the wit to find out what we really are for my part i snap my fingers at them all continued the gallant colonel suiting the action to the word and so i ever have done but that's no hindrance to my feeling a true respect for the real lady that is come amongst us now and i beg pardon for interrupting her so long and beg to conclude by saying that she may count upon being valued and approved as she deserves to be for there is not a people upon the whole earth that knows more thoroughly what's what than the citizens of the united states 
here colonel wingrove ceased speaking and expectorated while the honourable judge johnson bowed to him with the condescension of a man who knows himself to be the first person in the company what you have spoken colonel wingrove sir is of a piece with the good sense which we all know you give out in congress and which is just what in course we all expect from you but now it strikes me that it is time for mrs allen barnaby to begin again though it may be that she would find a drink of lemonade preferable in the first instance for this glorious fine climate of ours is most times found rather over hot by strangers from northernmost countries especially if as in the present case they happen to be in a room full of company mrs carmichael immediately obeyed this hint by clapping her hands upon which cleopatra and her younger sister chloe who were both in waiting on the outside of the open door started forward and lemonade and whisky were very liberally handed round to the numerous circle now then honoured madam said the judge may we take the liberty of asking you to progress in your agreeable reading mrs allen barnaby bowed and immediately proceeded if there is one point that is calculated to strike a reasonable stranger altogether free from vulgar prejudice more strongly than any other at first arriving in this favoured and immortal country it certainly is the contemplation of the comfort and happiness arising from the institution of slavery god bless my soul cried colonel beauchamp roused from his usual apathetic indolence by these stirring words that's one of the finest sentences that i ever listened to either in or out of congress and i don't care who hears me say it nobody can hear you say it sir remarked the mild-looking george gregory without agreeing in your judgment unless indeed we were so unhappy as to have among us some desperately malignant pennsylvanian or canting bostonian or the like traitors to their country and to common sense none other can fail to agree with you in thinking that the last passage read to us by this truly superior lady is a proof of the greatest triumph of sound judgment over canting prejudice coming as it does from an englishwoman that has perhaps ever been met with and deeply indeed madam ought we to value it for seldom is it i grieve to say that any writers whatever except among the poor persecuted planters themselves are ever found to have honest courage enough to speak out boldly in print in favour of this truly roman and magnificent institution but there is one word one little word my dear lady that it will be necessary to insert before your admirable work is sent to the press will you give me leave to suggest it there is nothing sir replied mrs allen barnaby with mingled gentleness and dignity there is nothing for which i should feel myself so deeply grateful as for any suggestions whether in the way of additions or alterations to this work which perhaps i have been only too eager to begin i am well aware that i must in all probability appear hasty but my earnest wish not a bit not a bit too hasty madam exclaimed the honourable judge johnson interrupting her i honour you for your eagerness madam and it is never too soon to begin doing what is right as to suggestions now and then in the way of addition you are much too smart a lady not to feel the advantage of it but i protest that in the way of alteration i don't see the slightest chance of its being called for or in any way necessary all we have ever asked of those who came over to enjoy our good things and take a spice as i may say of the elegance and luxury in which we live all we ask of them is that when they sit down after going back to write a book about what they have seen they should just speak the truth without fear or favour and say honestly that the united states of america stands just first and foremost and highest and noblest among all the nations of the earth that's all we want or wish for from any author male or female gentle or simple and by all i can understand from what this excellent good lady has read to us of her commencement he added looking round upon the listening circle this is pretty much the upshot of what she means to report herself upon my word sir said mrs allen barnaby with a very amiable smile i do not and cannot see how it is possible setting aside of course all sorts of wicked prejudice envy and the like i really do not see how it is possible to say anything else i wish it was possible for me to say madam that there were many such ladies in the world as you are replied the judge i reckon that in that case we wouldn't care no more for the boundary question than for a flea-bite and for that matter indeed if just that much was granted us the slavery boggle you know of course included i really and truly don't think that the right of search itself would be thought any great deal of long 
but now let us hear what it was that general gregory was meaning by his alteration hardly an alteration judge hardly an alteration returned the bland old gentleman what i ask for is merely the insertion of a word or two when the lady speaks of the agreeable impression which the sight of slavery makes on superior-minded people on their first arriving in the united states she must i think so far particularize as to make it clear that she speaks of the feelings which would arise in case this stranger should be fortunate enough to come as the lady herself did to a slave-holding state in the first instance for if instead of that the person arriving was to make their first acquaintance with the union at boston now for instance it is likely enough that they would never dream of such a thing as slavery at all and then in course it follows that they could not admire it i understand sir i understand perfectly said the intelligent mrs allen barnaby you are quite right the sentence as it now stands is exceedingly imperfect but if any gentleman will be good enough to lend me a pencil for a moment i will correct it a most surprising number of pencils and pencil cases seemed to spring as it were almost spontaneously from the waistcoat pockets of the surrounding gentlemen on seeing which the authoress threw around her smile most safely circular and took with admirable tact the pencil that was nearest well indeed might it have been said of her on this occasion oft she rejects but never once offends for among all the pencil-holders who had to return their unaccepted offerings to the receptacles from whence they were drawn not one of them so admirable had been mrs allen barnaby's manner of getting out of the scrape felt in the slightest degree offended it took of course a few minutes to reconstruct the defective sentence and during this interval there was scarcely a gentleman present who did not raise his voice to join in what might truly have been called a chorus of praise and admiration mrs allen barnaby heard and wrote and smiled and wrote again and much sooner than under these fluttering and flattering circumstances could have been expected she once more pushed back her curls and prepared to read in a moment every other voice was hushed and she thus resumed if there is one point that is calculated to strike a reasonable stranger altogether free from vulgar prejudice and arriving for the first time in that most highly favoured portion of the united states distinguished by the high privilege which was sanctioned by the immortal washington and by the illustrious jefferson approved a splendid phrase she had written down from the lips of mrs beauchamp it certainly is the contemplation of the comfort and happiness arising from the institution of slavery now then said the still wide-awake colonel beauchamp now then i think madam that you might challenge all the authors that ever wrote to show a sentence more full of truth and wisdom than that is i am sure madam we can never thank you enough and i for one beg to say that as long as it is suitable to your convenience and pleasure to continue in the union my house and home shall be open to you and yours and that nothing that i and my family can do shall be wanting to make you feel yourself as if you were a real born american a vast number of voices immediately reiterated nearly the same words and while this was going on mr egerton once more ventured to look in the face of annie it was however no longer a frown that he met there neither did any angry glow remain upon her brow she was indeed on the contrary unusually pale and he fancied although she did not raise her eyes that there were tears in them for their long dark lashes hung heavily like the fringe of a cypress branch besprinkled with dew upon her alabaster cheek but although annie did not raise her eyes when the young englishman turned to look at her it is possible that she was conscious of his doing so for in the next moment she had risen from her chair glided over the space which divided her from the window and stepped through it upon the balcony not many men of any age can see a very beautiful young girl in tears without experiencing some kindly softening of the heart towards them but at three or four and twenty this sort of softness is usually too powerful in its influence to permit for the moment at least the continuance of any harsh or hostile feeling and certainly mr egerton just then quite forgot the perfect americanism of annie beauchamp but what was stranger still though he very greatly wished to follow her he had not the courage or confidence to do it but though upon reaching the balcony she contrived so to place herself as not to be seen by either him or any one else in the room he was so much occupied by the image of her pale sad lovely face as she went out that he lost whatever advantage of any kind might have been gained by attending to what was going on in the saloon for he did not distinctly hear another word 
pleasantly conscious as mrs allen barnaby was of her great powers as well in her new occupation of writing a book as in everything else she had nevertheless found after the first sentence or two that the putting together the fine phrases which have been given above was likely to be a very great bore and to say the truth when she laughed off it was because she really did not know what she should say next it was then that the happy idea of writing down a few questions to be answered either by her inspiring muse mrs colonel beauchamp or by some one else of the high standards whose favour she was so anxious to propitiate occurred to her and now it stood her in excellent good stead for when upon the subsiding of the burst of grateful and hospitable feeling just described the honourable judge johnson raised his voice to request that she would continue instead of having to make the blank reply of sir i have got no more she was able to answer in a tone that instead of damping very greatly increased the interest she had already awakened now then my most kind and indulgent hearers she said i have a great a very great favour to ask of you and mrs allen barnaby drew forth from amidst the papers which she had placed upon the table the sheet upon which she had written her questions i have here she resumed put down one or two inquiries which strike me as being very important and in which i hope and trust my excellent friends here assembled will be kind enough to give me some information assuredly madam assuredly answered three or four voices at once please to read the inquiries madam only please to read them that's all mrs allen barnaby obeyed and in her most sonorous and impressive accents read in what manner does the republican form of government appear to affect the social habits of the people it was her intention to have gone through her whole string of questions before she paused to invite discussion on them but this was impossible you might have fancied yourself in the chamber of congress at washington so eager did every honourable member appear to speak on the subject now offered for discussion but by force of lungs and the impetus given to his determination to be heard by the consciousness that he was the richest man in the company it was the honourable judge johnson who finally succeeded in becoming spokesman on the occasion in what manner gracious heaven my dearest lady in every manner the republican form of government is just all in all without it you may take my word for it we should not be a bit better or a bit wiser or a bit more advanced than other people it is the republican form of government that makes us the citizens the statesmen the philosophers and the rich men that we are it is to the republican form of government that we owe our immense superiority in all ways it is that which makes us such fathers and husbands as we are it is that which makes us feared abroad and adored at home and to end all it is that which makes us great it is that which makes us glorious in one word it is that which makes us the greatest nation upon the earth and it is that which will keep us so while this was spoken mrs allen barnaby sat the very picture of mute and earnest attention her ear seemed to gather the sounds she heard as a miser might gather gold and her mind showing itself through her intelligent eye appeared already setting to work in order to form it into implements both of use and ornament such as might be scattered over the whole earth sure to become the most precious treasures of every land they reached when at length the judge stopped to take breath the listening lady rose from her seat and laying her hand upon her breast said in a manner that very greatly touched her hearers never can the impressive words i have now heard escape from my memory it was my intention to have written down whatever information i might have been happy enough to obtain in reply to my questions but for this one the answer is engraven here it is hardly necessary to narrate how these words were received cold indeed must be the heart that cannot imagine it when tranquillity was again restored mrs allen barnaby who had reseated herself during the moments wherein she had yielded herself as it were to applause once more took up her paper and read how far does the absence of a national form of worship produce the results anticipated from it oh that's answered in half a word madam resumed the judge who seemed to consider himself the chairman of the committee sitting to decide upon the lady's questions it just answers as we intended and that's enough we knew beforehand that it would never do for such a people as us to be schooling of one another for everlasting about forms and doctrines and the old one knows what 
you may just set down on that bit of the constitution that it works perfect and now if you please you may go on to the next at what degree of elevation may the education of the ladies of the union be considered to stand when compared to that received by the females of other countries oh my well now isn't that capital i expect that one and all we ladies must answer that for ourselves were words which like winged messengers seemed flying round mrs allen barnaby in all directions but happily in a tone which showed that if the ladies were called upon to speak for themselves it was a call to which they should have no objection to answer you may say that ladies said colonel wingrove gaily and politely winking at the most eager speakers nobody can answer that question i expect as well as your own pretty selves but if i was obliged to say my say on the subject i know that it would be just to declare that the gals of the union beat all creation not in any wise to mention all the other women in it and that they do out and out and out again ten millions of times over in every sort of learning and gentility as much as they do in beauty this gallant speech was received with a regular clapping of hands from all the gentlemen present while the gals simpered and tittered and smirked and brought their heads together in little whispering knots till at length one very young lady's voice was distinctly heard to say well now i do hope that she will write down that exactly without changing a word and so i will my dear young lady cried mrs allen barnaby affectionately and my heart dilates with pleasure as i look around me and think of the happy chance by which i have been called upon to do justice to such lovely and elegant creatures as i see here very prettily said ma'am said general gregory with his usual kind smile and i must observe that we have a right too to talk of our own good fortune that has brought us so altogether genteel and understanding a lady to write about us as yourself there is nobody to be found i expect general who will be ready to gainsay that word said the honourable judge johnson and now i shall give my vote and interest for our being all silent while this excellent lady goes on with her questions now then ma'am we are all mum i have but one or rather i should say that i have but two questions more on my list at present said mrs allen barnaby i say two because i perceive that i have divided the subject under two distinct heads but if you will give me leave i will read them both together as being too intimately connected for division and if i mistake not gentlemen you will feel the subject to be one of very great importance and of a nature to require the very best and most correct information before i can venture to write upon it in what manner was slavery originally instituted and what are its real effects both on the white and the black population scarcely had mrs allen barnaby pronounced the words when so many voices were raised to answer her that for some minutes nothing could be heard distinctly this will never do gentlemen cried the judge raising his powerful voice to its very highest pitch we are one and all interested in this question or the devil's in it but if you all keep on jabbering together at this infernal rate just like so many wild geese when they are settling down upon a common i should like to know how the lady is to understand rightly a single word you say i don't want or wish to put myself forward excepting in fit time and season but i expect there is no one here that will attempt to deny that the advocation of my principles upon this subject in congress has done something towards startling the new englanders off from their infernal abolition nonsense and if so i think it is but fair to give me a try as to whether i can't startle the old englanders a little too what do you say gentlemen are you willing to let me answer the lady or are you not however much many of the individuals present might have desired to hear themselves speak a little on this very favourite theme a very decided majority made it understood that they were willing to accept the honourable judge johnson as their substitute and no sooner was this made perfectly clear and silence obtained than the judge rose up and putting himself in the attitude in which he always addressed the members of congress he thus spoke as to the first member of your requirement my good lady i will just take the liberty of saying that you may go to your bible for an answer and if you don't exactly know where to look for it there is that excellent pious christian the lady of general gregory will show you for she has got it all at her fingers ends about cain being turned black by the hand of the lord on purpose that he might become the father of a nation of blackymore nigger slaves 
and that's the top and head of the institution as i take it however i will leave that part of the subject to her because it is well known to everybody in our part of the country that there is no one be he priest parson or prelate that understands it better but i will take upon me in my own person to make a reply to the other portion of your inquiry that being altogether in my own way and touching direct upon points whereon my principles have been prettily generally received in congress as standard principles of the wealthiest the most enlightened and in all ways the most important portion of the union the honourable judge here paused for a moment spit wiped his mouth with the back of his hand and then proceeded as to the effect of slavery upon the white part of the population as that is the way in which you have been pleased to put your question my good lady whereas we should say as to its effect upon the masters it is altogether a matter too clear to admit of any mistake in the first place it makes the only real gentleman in the union in the second place it saves the finest people upon god's earth from the abominable degradation of having no servants proper and fitting as regular servants to wait upon them thirdly slavery is known on all sides to be the only way in which the glorious fine sun and soil of this noblest of all countries can be turned to the best account fourthly there is no other way that man can invest by which such fortunes can be made in the union as may enable among the free-born of our glorious citizens and immortal republic to keep up the credit of the country both at home and abroad in such a way as to give us proper dignity in the eyes of europe and now madam i will leave off speaking upon this head for the present because i calculate that i have said about as much as you will be able to remember at one go but i have got not less than fifty-seven reasons altogether which i can bring forward when you are ready for them to support my principles but with which i will not now charge your memory in the fear that you might not remember them all clearly but this signifies the less because it is proper madam that you keep in mind the necessity of coming again upon this part of your subject it being greatly beyond all comparison the most important of all as to your question about the niggers themselves poor filthy varmint it is vastly easy to answer it just state if you please my good lady saying as you safely may that it is upon the best possible authority just state that if for many excellent reasons the gentlemen planters had not thought it advisable to take these poor wretches under their protection by making regular lawful slaves of them so that they cannot luckily for them get away if it was not for this you will be pleased to say that it is satisfactorily proved by all the philosophers as have examined the subject that they would beyond all question in a very few years be found running about in the forests on all fours just like any other beasts unless indeed as some think would have been the case they would come to an end by eating one another up this my dear lady is what we have saved them from and this is what ought to be put forward before the eyes of all europe and so it shall sir said mrs allen barnaby again rising with an air of indescribable dignity blind indeed must those be who cannot see the light when it is thus admirably put before them madam you are a thorough lady replied the judge with a low bow and now i put the question whether we should not be the better for a little more of good mrs carmichael's lemonade for the ladies and whisky for the gentlemen and then to my judgment it would be most convenient that we should not remain much longer there being much desirability in our taking ourselves off before this good lady shall have lost out of her head all that i have been endeavouring to put in it End of chapter twenty Chapter Twenty One of the Barnabys in America by Francis Milton Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty One. Mrs. Allen Barnaby receives numerous notes of invitation, specimens of the soiree, their effect on Mrs. Allen Barnaby. She falls asleep and has a vision. Before twelve o'clock next day, Mrs. Allen Barnaby had received fifteen notes of invitation for herself, her family, and friends some of these were for dinner and evening parties at new orleans and some for visits of longer duration which the distinguished travellers were entreated to make at the hospitable dwellings of the writers during the progress of their proposed tour 
to copy all these documents is unnecessary as the same hospitable and patriotic spirit appeared to pervade them all but one or two ought to be given in justice to the eloquence with which these feelings were expressed the following are selected without the slightest partiality of any kind except what arises from feeling that they are peculiarly well calculated to serve as specimens of the whole number one madam much has been said a great deal too much upon the deficiency of mutual good liking between the great and glorious union of america and the islands of great britain you madam shall prove in your own person that as far as the noble-hearted citizens of the united states are concerned the charge is altogether false and unfounded mrs major wiggs and myself desire the pleasure and satisfaction you may observe as a national trait if you please madam that in addressing the natives of great britain the citizens of the united states never talk of doing honour and that sort of nonsense and when you madam have seen a little more of them you will become aware for your capacity is already proved to be of the best that they don't stand in a situation for any mortal creature on god's earth to do them an honour but to return to business major wiggs and his lady hereby request the pleasure of your company together with your husband in course and all your travelling companions inclusive to a ball and supper at their house and plantation called the levee lodge just two miles off new orleans this day week i remain madam with the utmost of respect for your individual elegance of mind cornelius alexander wiggs number two much esteemed lady after what was read and heard in mrs carmichael's keeping-room last night i expect it is not very needful for me to say why it is that i and my lady mrs colonel staggers desire your further acquaintance we being amongst those who acting in conformity with all reasonable laws human and divine do the best that in us lies as in duty bound to uphold and support the greatly misunderstood and much wrongly abused institution of slavery you will understand therefore madam without more said why it comes that we so entirely approbate the superior elegance of the literature which was displayed to us last night and this brings me to the point and purpose of this present writing which is to give you an invitation and your good family all of them with you to a grand dinner-party which it is my intention to give in your favour on the nineteenth instant at five o'clock p m i am respected lady your literary admirer michael angelo jefferson staggers number three the honourable mrs secretary von donderhoft presents her gratified compliments to the highly gifted and superior-minded mrs allen barnaby and in conjunction with her husband the honourable mr secretary von donderhoft requests the pleasure of mrs allen barnaby's favouring company together with that of the party supposed to belong to her to an evening soiree when the honourable mrs secretary von donderhoft will have the advantage of presenting mrs allen barnaby to a great number of her friends of the most first-rate standing and consideration which she flatters herself may be a gratification and every way an advantage to mrs allen barnaby the evening fixed for the honourable mrs secretary von donderhoff's soiree is next monday week number four madam your purpose is as noble as are the talents which heaven appears to have given you for the means of effecting it i respect you as you deserve mrs allen barnaby and in saying this it seems madam to me that i say everything myself and mrs governor tapway will consider it as a pleasure to receive you at our plantation mansion on the banks of crocodile creek for as long a time as you and your friends can make it convenient to bide with us my wish being to show for the assistance of your writing that any unagreeable feelings which may have been visible in the united states of north america towards those that come travelling and spying from the old country have arisen wholly and altogether from the too certain fact of knowing that we were going to be faulted and abused whereas you madam being altogether upon a new lay in the descriptive line may look in like manner of novelty altogether for a different style of conduct on our part and i have no doubt but that you and yours will be satisfied with the same i remain madam your true admirer and sincere success-wisher stephen orlando bones tapway besides these which i have taken the trouble to transcribe on account of their peculiar graces of style mrs allen barnaby received no less than eleven other letters in the course of the morning which followed the triumphant exhibition of her powers as an author all of them bearing the strongest testimonies of admiration and esteem and all conveying very earnest invitations of one sort or another both to herself and the ladies and gentlemen in her train 
on receiving the first of these very gratifying testimonials mrs allen barnaby her cheek flushed and her eyes sparkling with all sorts of gratified feelings rose hastily from the easy-chair in her own apartment in which she chanced to be reposing when it arrived and was just going to look for her daughter and the perkinses in order to share her pleasure and her triumph with them when a second was delivered to her by the grinning cleopatra she returned of course to her chair that she might peruse it undisturbed and then her purpose changed and it was to mrs beauchamp that she determined first to display these trophies of success again therefore she stepped forward and again her steps were arrested by cleopatra who now brought no less than three letters in her hand at once and so struck was the black messenger herself at this extraordinary influx of dispatches that having laid down the three letters she stood stock still in front of the table to see how the english lady looked while she was reading of them but mrs allen barnaby was by this time in a frame of mind which rendered such examination extremely annoying to her and raising her voice and her hand so as to command both respect and obedience she said leave me girl leave me i tell you leave me instantly poor cleopatra liked not the voice much but she liked the hand less still for not having the slightest doubt that it was to be employed in the way in which raised hands always are employed towards people of her complexion in louisiana she actually quivered from top to toe for mrs allen barnaby's hand was not a small one uttering therefore only the monosyllable o oh, in reply she left the room much more rapidly than she entered it and the lady was left in her secret bower to enjoy unlooked at and alone all the delicious triumph of that happy hour she read and re-read the five notes which now lay all opened wide upon the table before her and then she sat for a few moments in motionless and silent reverie at length however her features relaxed into a smile and she exclaimed aloud i wonder what would happen if i were to take into my head to make myself a queen i wonder whether anybody or anything would be found able to stop me i'll be hanged if i believe there would however i don't mean to try my hand at it just at present because i don't believe i could enjoy it more if i was ten times a queen than i do now seeing all those people who own themselves that they have always hated us english like poison seeing them all ready to fall down and worship me just because it came into my head to think that i should find it answer to make myself popular an answer it does or the deuce is in it why we might one and all of us live at free quarters for a twelvemonth at this rate and i shall take care to make the perkinses understand that they are to pay me if they pay nobody else that is but fair and honest and if they don't plague me in any way i will let them have a good bargain what will the major say to me i wonder now and here mrs allen barnaby almost laughed aloud in her exceeding glee but she was not left long to enjoy in tranquillity this first full evidence of her complete success for another slave and not the terrified cleopatra soon entered her room and deposited three more notes before her and again after another short interval the same black girl returned her enormous eyes grown more enormous still by wondering at the business she was about and laid down four more and in less than five minutes after she entered with three thus completing the fifteen which seemed to terminate the embassies for the time being to say that mrs allen barnaby felt and looked delighted as she thus sat surrounded by these white-winged messengers of fame would be an expression so pitifully and unsatisfactorily weak that i forbear to use it but where may i look for words capable of expressing aptly and fully the state of mind into which she was thrown by this enthusiastic outpouring of patriotic gratitude look where i will i shall find none such it is in fact impossible for any faculty or faculties save imagination alone to do justice to her emotions and to the imagination of my readers i resign the task though only too well aware that of these not above one in five hundred can be expected to possess the faculty in sufficient vigour to do justice to the image i have suggested never in truth was there a mind more calculated to enjoy such success than that of my heroine there are many who though they may relish fame with tolerable keenness in general would feel no great exaltation of spirit at this species of it in particular but mrs allen barnaby was not one of these neither could she notwithstanding her well-satisfied contemplations on her past life be classed with those so blase with distinction and renown as to make the receiving it a matter of indifference nor did the shower of happiness which so delightfully bathed her spirit in this hour of joy bring empty praise alone on the contrary a vast deal of very solid seeming pudding appeared coming with it 
and in short mrs allen barnaby felt her contentment to be so measureless and so greatly too big for utterance that she suddenly determined not to mention what had happened to any one till she had first enjoyed it for a little while in secret and till she felt capable of conversing upon it with less external emotion than she was at present conscious must betray itself were she to enter upon the subject immediately with any one unless indeed it was her lawful husband and partner of her greatness i will lie down she murmured to herself as she passed her pocket-handkerchief across her forehead i will darken the room and lie down she fastened the blinds and drew the window-curtains accordingly and then having laid aside a considerable portion of her apparel she crept within her mosquito-net and laid her throbbing head upon her pillow there is something in the climate of new orleans which tends so strongly to induce sleep that probably no degree of happiness could enable any person long to resist it if they indulged in the attitude which mrs allen barnaby had now taken certain it is that many minutes had not elapsed after my heroine had disposed of herself in the manner i have described before her eyes closed and her regular but heavy breathing proclaimed aloud that she slept but oh what a sleep was that and how far unlike the dull oblivion that falls upon ordinary spirits while the sweet restorer is doing his work upon them no sooner had she forgotten herself as the common and unphilosophical phrase expresses it no sooner had she forgotten herself than a power nobler than memory took its place mrs allen barnaby did not forget herself though it was less by memory than by prophecy that she became in sleep the subject of her own high imaginings it was probably from the more than common intensity of the emotions which produced these sleeping visions that she at once gave birth to them in words and with perfect distinctness exclaimed pray move out of the way louisa do you not see how all these good people are straining and striving to get a glimpse of me matilda it is quite ill-natured to keep standing so exactly before me it is quite contrary to my temper and disposition to torment people so oh yes certainly she continued varying her tone as if speaking courteously to some stranger yes certainly my lord if you will just push that golden inkstand a little nearer to me i will give you an autograph immediately for a moment or two she was silent and then turning as it were impatiently on her bed she resumed in accents less bland it is nonsense donny to think of it it is not you who have written all these books and if you as you all justly enough say a title must and will be given as in the case of sir walter and sir edward it cannot be given to you no donny no it must and will be given to me yes yes hush 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 i know it i know it i know perfectly well major allen without your telling me that no ladies are ever made baronets i know i can't be sir martha foolish man quite as well as you do and i know a little better perhaps that you will never be sir anything but if my country wishes to reward me by a title to which i should have no objection whatever if such be the will of my sovereign if that as you all seem to suppose should really be the case i see neither difficulty nor objection in it why should i not be called lady martha and then she murmured on till her voice sank into silence and herself into sounder sleep lady martha allen barnaby lady martha allen barnaby lady allen martha bar it was clearly evident that my heroine had positively exhausted herself by the vehemence of her emotions even in sleep for she now snored heavily for above two hours without again moving a limb and on awakening experienced that feeling of puzzle and confusion of intellect which often follows sleep that has been unusually profound where am i she exclaimed starting up and looking very wildly around her but most sweet was the return of consciousness which followed she saw the mass of open notes all lying together upon her table is it then possible she exclaimed is it indeed true and not merely the invention of a dream am i really at this moment the most distinguished person in new orleans and what may i not hope for hereafter but mercy on me i really must keep myself quiet or i shall certainly go distracted the resolution was a wise one and kept to better than might have been expected from the very animated and excitable nature of mrs allen barnaby she looked at her watch and perceived that it was fully time to begin preparing to dress for dinner and she set about this necessary business with a deliberate steadiness which showed her determined to keep herself and her nerves quiet and composed 
the result of this was all that she herself wished it should be her ringlets her rouge her flowers and her bows all took their respective places without any trace of that confusion of arrangement which might reasonably enough have been feared under the existing circumstances before her dress had received its last finishing touch by the arrangement of her white blonde scarf she heard the approaching step of the major and smiled but very sedately as she cast her eyes upon the letter-covered table pour out some water for me there's a good soul said the unconscious husband of the most distinguished person in new orleans i'm devilish late i believe there is no occasion to put yourself into such a prodigious bustle if you are returned his lady with an air of very elegant languor the dinner must be kept back a little if we are not ready for it keep back keep back the dinner at an american boarding-house i should have thought my dear that you had been here quite long enough to know that wouldn't answer did you ever see any one of them waited for half a second even among the oldest customers like the beauchamps or any of them i beg your pardon major but i cannot exactly think it the same thing nobody i imagine would like to sit down till till we were ready the major opened his eyes but was too busy in adjusting his cravat to remove them from the looking-glass and mrs allen barnaby was really too much afraid of shaking her equanimity to trust her voice in explanation but when his hasty reparation of himself being completed he turned about and looked towards his wife who had quietly seated herself at the table he perceived the large number of open letters with which it was covered and immediately uttered the expected question what in the world are all those letters wife you may read them major allen barnaby if you wish it she meekly replied while quietly employing herself in securing the clasp of her waist ribbon the major accepting the permission thus given immediately set himself to the task of examination but had proceeded but a very little way in it when he gaily exclaimed well done my barnaby egad we are afloat now or the devil's in it and assuring himself by a hasty glance through the remainder that they were all in the same agreeable strain he actually walked round the table and kissed the illustrious fair one to whom they were addressed taking the greatest care however to disturb neither her ringlets nor her rouge i am proud of you mrs allen barnaby i am upon my soul he said and what think you my dear will be the best way to profit by all this why here are no less than nine invitations for staying visits at different country seats if we could but find out wife who amongst them enjoys a little piquet you know like colonel beauchamp and who does not we could manage our matters famously it would be fun wouldn't it to be going from house to house treated and feasted you writing your immortal books and i raking in dollars every night of my life and our own money lying snug all the time it would be famous fun wouldn't it why certainly the mode of life as you sketch it major would be pleasant enough and profitable too i dare say replied his lady if we mind our hits properly it will be exceedingly necessary however to find out who's who and what's what before we decide upon what to accept and what to refuse i have said to all that i would send an answer and this will give us a little time for inquiry you are a jewel exclaimed the major with a burst of really passionate admiration but there goes the bell my darling after dinner you must write me down the names of all these excellent people that i may learn what i can about them and you may keep the letters you know and ask a few questions of mrs beauchamp or anybody else who can answer them i shall not be idle my dear replied his wife with a composed and quiet smile which proved to her acute husband that she was not quite in her usual state of mind but he was at that moment inclined to think that all moods became her and taking his arm within hers he led her with a very decided feeling of triumph to the dinner-table chapter twenty one